Uh, I just let me um, say good morning to all the students. So let me introduce myself. I am Barbara Jacob Small, and I'm associated with the Replast OECS Plastic uh, Pilot Plastic Recycling Project in the capacity of the communications coordinator. So I am responsible for things like public relations and public education, and also keeping the various stakeholders that are involved with the Replast project up to date on what's happening with the project. Now, with me this morning are a team of resource people that we have pulled together um, to be able to engage with you and to facilitate you so that, um, you know, you have your, your research for your school assignments, um, uh, uh, you know, that you have a rich um, set of information that you, you can extract to, towards your, your assignments. So this team... Um, comprises uh, representatives from the Department of Sustainable Development, the, the general manager of the St. Lucia Solid Waste Management Authority, and the waste management consultant associated with the Replas OECS Pilot Plastic Recycling Project. Before I introduce them, I think it would be appropriate for me to just ask Dr. Um, Felix to just give some, some brief comments, her own welcome to the students because you know what the assignment scope is. And so I imagine you know, her remarks can give us some context for um, the opportunity that you have this morning, given that solid um, team of resource people. So Dr. Felix. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Barbara. Um, good morning, Mr. Seeley. And I, I actually didn't get the names of the others, but um, the representative from for sustainable development. Good morning, and thank you so much for agreeing to take time off to be here. And then um, uh, from the um, replast, the officer in charge specifically dealing with waste management at the engineer. I think thank you so much for being here. And then most of all students, thank you. Um, the students that you have today are students who are senior, they are second year students who are doing the environmental science CAPE program. Um, we have also invited the year one students, they are doing the environmental science associate degree. For both groups, one of the things that we seek to do at the South Lewis Community College is not just to simply make the learning of environmental science an academic exercise, but there, we, we try very hard to get the students to be very much aware of what is happening on the ground in St. Lucia and in the rest of the Caribbean. The hope is that we will really produce persons who just don't know the basics of or the principles of environmental science and ecology and how we should manage, but where they can start to look around and take put it in context based on what is happening in the country. It is our hope that whether they graduate and get employment within the Department of Fisheries, the Department of Forestry and Sustainable Development, or whether they go into the private sector and again are making some contribution, that they are making a contribution to sustainable development in the country. And we, we know that we have many challenges and what um, we try to do is let the students be aware of these challenges. They have to be aware and they have to look at these challenges through very clear spectacles that they've got to look at it in the eyes of the fact that St. Lucia is a small island developing state and that we cannot enjoy the luxury of looking around at our natural resources and just watching it and enjoying it, that we have to use these natural resources, but at the same time, we have to do so in a sustainable way. And then the question of the challenges and how do we relate and how do we engage the private sector and the regional and international community in order for us to achieve this. So I'm really, really happy to have all of you here. And I'm hoping students, this is your opportunity to get as much information, remembering that most of you will be graduating this year. And some of these people may end up being your bosses or your supervisors in the near future. 
but you truly want to understand what is happening with regards to solid waste in general, but specifically plastics, which is the area of our focus for our research, and to try to um, ask as many questions, whether you think they're difficult or not, ask questions on policy, ask questions on is does this make sense, ask questions on St. Lucia's performance, is St. Lucia getting where it wants to, and if it is not, why not? So thank you once more, everyone, for being here. I'm hoping we have a very lively, I know it's going to be informative. I also hope it's going to be lively. And students, I know we have some of my students here who are a little bit shy, and I'm asking them not to be. You all have a lot of information. I need you to show up a little bit and show the team what this Arthur Lewis Community College Environmental Science students are made of. So thank you once more. And thank you so much, Barbara, for organizing this panel discussion. Thank you very much. I could not have done a better job at this intro. So at this point, what I will do is I will introduce the general manager of the St. Lucia Solid Waste Management Authority. His name is Mr. Justin Seeley. He's on. Um, I will ask him to put on his mic um, in a little while. Um, I will introduce as well, Mr. Ronald Roach. Mr. Roach is the waste management specialist who's associated with the Replast OECS pilot plastic recycling project. Um, and he is involved in a lot of aspects of getting this project off the ground and getting the ecosystem, the team, the, the, the organizations and the businesses, you know, that are in waste management um, in St. Lucia, getting them um, equipped and trained to be able to do um, this work of, of, of um, plastic recycling in St. Lucia and to look at the market, what the market is like for plastic recycling. So Mr. Roach is pretty broad based. So he'll be doing our second presentation. So he will put on his mic in a little while and introduce himself. And the other set of resource people we have come from the Department of Sustainable Development. Um, and I think we have a team of about three. So my contact with sustainable development was Miss um, Janelle Norville. Um, so when they are being introduced, I will ask her to lead these introductions. But for now, I'm going to hand you over to Mr. Justin Seeley. Um, who is the general manager of the St. Lucia Solid Waste Management Authority. And why are we starting off with Mr. Seeley? Um, because in St. Lucia, we know that the Solid Waste Management Authority is responsible for this in St. Lucia, for managing solid waste. And so who better to tell us where we are, what our problems are, what we be, should be thinking about, you know, um, taking care of solving our problems, what we have, what don't we have, you know, and, and what the Solid Waste Management Authority's vision is, um, what its strategic plan to be able to get us to where we're supposed to be. So we'll start with Mr. Justin. I really wish he could, um, Mr. Roach, we could minimize the screen on his presentation so Mr. Justin can put on his mic and he can do some, you know, brief remarks before he goes into his presentation. Good morning, everybody. I'm Justin Silly, General Manager. As Ms. Small said, um, I, I will get straight into the presentation, just keep it nice and short, and that will, uh, from there, I know that there's little side avenues that we could always go down with conversations. So, um, solid waste management is about waste management. I would have loved to be in, in person, but I like to ask persons what what are their views of waste management? And over the years, we've gotten it to be simply collect garbage and dot, 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 because some people don't even know what happens to the garbage subject after it, it was put out to the curb. So with this intro to the intro, could you, thank you very much. So as we stayed here, the presentation is where we are, um, and I'll try to give, uh, from the three dots I place as to what is waste management, I will try to build a background around that and which will give you an idea as to what are we doing now and where we would like to go. Um, due to the fact that I was presenting this to the school, I did put into in here IT and waste management and um, just to capture the attention because I know a lot of people are into IT 
And uh, I am big on data and information because that is what is, that is what is going to, data and information is what is going to give you, uh, be able to assess where you are now with your, and then decide how or when you go. Where would you like to go and in what kind of manner you go there in, in that world? Next slide, please. So this is an overview. Um, I guess we could all take a read if we want, sort of having to read out all this. Um, we will see that the authority is responsible for waste from the time it, somebody puts waste out. For collection, it becomes the responsibility and the possession of the Solid Waste Management Authority. And we collect waste from designated collection points or curbside collection um, through, throughout the island. As you can see, the island is broken up into 11 zones. Presently, we operate a, a sanitary landfill um, at Deglo. And uh, we will say sanitary landfill because of the manner in which it is supposed to operate. Um, that means waste is brought in, placed on the ground, compacted, covered with a layer of soil on a daily basis. And um, all, all what you see dripping out of the waste, which is called leachate, is collected, diverted for treatment before it's put back out into the environment. Um, we had the same, we had a sort of scale down version of a sanitary landfill at Viewfort. However, due to other environmental concerns and operational concerns for the, for the Hiranoro Airport, it had to be, have stopped landfilling down there. So what we're actually doing, which I will get into the latter part of my presentation, is to introduce new technology which with the aim of, of better waste management. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a rough breakdown of the waste that we get, we, we collect on an annual basis. So as you see, um, we get in the range of about 80, 80 tons, which is uh, up by uh, up over a little over a ton from 2019 to 2020. And um, this is what we collect from, well, the biggest, the biggest volumes are from residential and commercial. Of what we collect from persons, this is how it is broken down into, um, well, from different industries. So there's what we collect from the airports, aircraft, biomedical waste, which we also collect from medical facilities. Um, so what you, whatever, if you ever went into a health center or hospital, anything that you see disposed of in the red bin is actually collected on the biomedical and it is treated differently at the Deglu Sanitary Landfill. And we have coconut waste because it's just because of the sheer volume of what we get. We actually highlighted it as a special category. C and D you see here is um, construction and demolition waste. So this is what, um, how the waste is broken down. Next slide, please. Of these quantities that we get, um, this is some of the general waste streams, things that you, we, 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 we track, you may say, in our waste. The glass, the metal, cardboard, paper, e-waste. E-waste is anything from electronic devices, televisions, cell phones, any of those things, hair dryers. <laughs> um, so then we have organics. Uh, in here, we normally term organics are us is usually what comes out of your kitchen. We do have another category which we call green waste, which is what comes from the, you may say the landscapers, tree cuttings, um, grass cut clippings and these kind of things. Um, what we have on the next side is plastics, which is what um, I know that um, Unity Caribbean and the Replash project is very is very is concentrating on. And we do have a share of a vast volume of tires. Also here we do while we we are responsible for waste oil, any oils out of vehicles and all of those things which are collected in a special container at um, places that we place our place those containers. However, um, we have two private sector companies which make very good use of this waste oil in other avenues. So it never gets dis disposed of at the landfill. And that is a little segue into where we would like to go, which is um, circular economy. But um, next slide, please. So this is the Deglu Sanitary Landfill. This is an aerial view, of course. 
Um, as you see, we up to the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a, 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 a pileup of tires. The, the building next to it is where the, we have a tire, a tire shredder. Um, and we, that, these are, so this is a pileup of it for now for shredding. Um, at that landfill where you see the, the lagoon is where we collect and we treat all the, the leachate that sips out from the mountain of waste. Um, which you see at the bottom. Well, um, to the pick on the bottom left-hand side is what we are. This is called a walk-in floor container. So um, since we stopped landfilling at Viewfort, uh, a certain amount, a certain percentage of the waste is driven up to the English and Larry landfill for disposal. Next slide, please. Okay, resources, alternatives, and opportunities. So this, what I just presented is what we do right now, um, which, which actually goes in tandem with what you consider the linear economy, take, use, and dispose of. Where we would like to go is in what we, call, what, what is, what we know as the circular economy, where things are used, and once they stop being useful in the, in the the primary form, they could actually, the residual could actually be put into uh, uh, a system where it becomes value on, on the next side. So me being big on information, next slide, please. Over the last three years, the, the authority managed to implement an, an information technology system to actually track a number of facets of waste management. Um, whereas going back to my previous, my initial set of words, whereas a, lot, a number of persons look at waste management as just the collection of garbage and, and, dispo, and well, disappearance of it, um, we have to actually track all what we get. Um, we, in going in the transition to what we consider the circular economy, we, um, sorry, I lost my chair, I thought that. You need to, we basically, you have to start looking at, stop looking at waste as just waste, but waste as a resource. And the, what you put out has residual value and can be used in another industry. But it's always good to, to have an idea as to what are you generating. So the IT, the information technology that we, we now have going on in here allows us to track what is, we would like to track basically what is being put out, where is, it, where is it getting injected into the system as well, what quantity you have, and, and in that, in knowing that, it could actually help you better understand what you can do with, with that resource. So, so next slide, please. And um, as of October 2019, this is, this is a new waste management system being implemented in the South. At the heart of that system is this unit you are seeing here, which is called a pyrolysis unit. What it does, it uh, uses high temperatures to thermally treat waste brought to it at temperatures um, at a, at a, running from a minimum of about 700 degrees Celsius upwards. And um, it produces an ash. This ash is well, for now, we look at it as about 4% of the total waste placed in those units. However, the, while this is, this is being introduced, it is allowing us to better, well, improve the system of using this, this um, unit and thereby getting the most eff efficient use out of it. So next slide, please. This is where segregation, well, segregation is, in, is important for a number of reasons, but due to the fact that this is a thermal, a thermal unit which uses high temperatures, the excess water in the waste um, is, slows down the process. So soon the authority will be introducing segregation and segregation in, we believe in that kind of manner where wet waste will be um, taken out, which is the organics from your kitchen. And we believe there is, um, other, other waste streams that, that could be put out separately. So in, in, in working in tandem with the thought process behind the replast project, we would have a category called plastics. So I'm giving you some of the so coming, soon, coming, coming to you soon of waste management. Next slide, please. And so coming 
to where we would ultimately like to go. And this is all of all what we're doing here now is pieces in leading up to what we call a circular economy. And um, I know that maybe over the years, persons saying that they involve in waste management, you get a totally different, um, there's a stigma attached to it of two guys in the back of a truck collecting garbage and heading off. However, waste management is very, very involved and it cuts across a number of disciplines. I presented to Sir Afolowis on another forum about the circular economy and how it relates to waste management. This slide I place here is to dovetail into that presentation, which I didn't think it was necessary to give at this forum. However, I have instructed that the, that presentation could be um, circulated, where I believe it tailors more to maybe students coming out and heading into the environmental management as to what can be done. Understandably, waste management is beyond just one discipline. It actually, proper waste management involves a number of disciplines, taking into account cultural issues, um, the socioeconomic issues, the socio-political issues, then there's the engineering, as you see, IT and technology, um, and engineering and waste management, of course. Over the, over the last two, two years, um, solid waste management has actually um, employed on short-term job, job displacement. Students from Safa Lewis, and one student, the first student, actually helped us set up a, a platform, an IT platform for us to now use what we're using now. The second student were actually involved in a project where we termed it the digi um, well, digi digitization of information. However, what they actually helped us do, even in the waste management sector, allow us to transform from a lot of paper-based um, routines and, and help us establish a filing system where everything is put in electronically, allowing us to reduce some paper use. Um, and actually this is now serving benefit because now because of the pandemic, um, a lot of my staff have to work remotely and they actually take, make use of those systems. So what, why I put those points in is that um, if, if we just look at waste management as two guys on the back of a truck, it limits your understanding of how the many different facets of what you might learn um, coupled with other disciplines could actually give you uh, another facet or another view at waste management and thereby help you make, make a contribution to waste management and don't just limit yourself as that. So there, I think that I will end right here um, where I say thank you with our mascot called Tintin and uh, I guess, I, any questions if, if need be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Seeley, for that very insightful um, presentation. Students, I hope you, um, some you know, bells rang off in your head and you noted things you may want to ask Mr. Seeley a little more about. What we will do next is to go to our second presentation by Mr. Ronald Roach, Waste Management Specialist, with the REPLAS OECS project, um, and followed by the presentation by Department of Sustainable Development, and then we will open up for questions. Hi, so good morning all. Um, I must say it's a, really a pleasure for me to be here this morning and to be part of uh, this forum. So I'd like to thank you all uh, for allowing us this opportunity. I am going to talk about the Replast OECS pilot plastic uh, recycling project just very briefly. Um, so let's get started. So uh, starting off with plastic pollution, uh, Justin, Mr. Seeley would have spoken about the components of the waste stream, one of them uh, being uh, plastic and the very uh, attributes that make plastic such a versatile material and such a ubiquitous material are those same attributes that make it very 
problematic in the environment. So globally, plastic pollution is recognized as one of the top environmental problems that we are faced with, and it's because of those properties. Uh, it lasts long. Plastics uh, take hundreds, if not thousands of years to degrade. Um, and when they degrade, degrade into smaller plastics, and those are called microplastics, and microplastics have been uh, seen to end up um, right along the food chain back to uh, humans, and we don't even understand um, the consequences of that as yet. So it can be very problematic, and that's what we have to recognize um, in starting to tackle the problem. Uh, and just how problematic it is, the reality is that the top 10 items from the International Coastal Cleanup were all plastic items. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, International Coastal Cleanup Program. Uh, St. Lucia is uh, one of the participants in that, um, as is a number of countries in the Caribbean. And it's where once a year, usually in October, uh, people get together and clean up the beaches, um, the the purpose of that is to uh, clean the beaches, yes, but also to collect data on what are the uh, components of uh, litter that are found on the beaches. And um, all 10, the top 10 items were in fact um, plastics and number three in particular, plastic beverage bottles and number four, plastic bottle caps, yeah. So why do you replace OECS project? Well, as I would have just explained, globally, regionally, and locally, plastic pollution puts stress on the natural systems, endangers wildlife, enters the food chain, and reduces the tourism potential of destinations such as St. Lucia. And of course, the economy of St. Lucia is substantially based on tourism. And when a person, um, a tourist comes to your island and um, you know, it's littered with, with plastic. And so then they, they don't recommend it and, and it affects your tourism potential. There are currently no sustained programs in place for sorting and recycling of plastic waste in St. Lucia. There is a high incidence of indiscriminate dumping and littering of plastics in the environment, resulting in blocked waterways and flooding. And uh, a recent Forbes article identified the Caribbean islands as the biggest biggest plastic polluters per capita in the world. And maybe later on we can discuss uh, why that may be so. So what is the Replast project objective? And it's simply to create a sustainable circular economic model for managing and recycling plastic waste in the Caribbean. And Mr. Seeley would have uh, just spoken about uh, that circular mo model concept. And just to reiterate, what it involves is instead of the linear model that we have, which is uh, make, sorry, take, make, and dispose. The circular economic model is based on utilizing uh, the resources that we have not, um, and having it recycled and recirculated in the society and not having it end up, end up as waste. So that is um, the objective um, and it's focused on managing and recycling plastic waste. Just let me say, somebody has their mic on and it's making quite a din. Can you just double check and make sure that your mic is off, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. So there are four components to the REPLAS project. And the first component is collection, sorting, and management of PET bottles involving public, private, and local stakeholders. So public um, stakeholders, including the St. Lucia Solid Waste, uh, management authority, including the OECS, uh, private, um, including uh, companies such as Massey and uh, um, several others that are involved in supporting um, the project financially, and the local stakeholders, including the local recycling companies. Once the material is collected and sorted, uh, then it is exported uh, to 
the Caribbean, in this case, the wider Caribbean, and the current um, buyer is in Honduras. And they take that, um, those PET bottles and they make new products such as mops and fiber for uh, toys and so forth. Third component is the awareness of the population of St. Lucia about the ecological issues surrounding the collection, sorting, and management of recyc recyclable waste. So uh, letting uh, the population become aware of the need for that circular economic approach, the need to reduce what is going into the landfill, the need to ensure that uh, bottles don't end up on, on the, the waysides and in, in, in the beaches and so forth. Um, and just creating that overall awareness of having um, a circular economy concept for those PET bottles. And then once this is done in St. Lucia, the final uh, component is the replication of the pilot action in other territories in the Eastern Caribbean. So St. Lucia is the pilot project. Um, we are testing out the system and fine tuning it. And once we have a sustainable model, then the expectation is it will be replicated in other Caribbean countries. One major component of the project is having an incentivized collection system. Um, that means that you will be uh, provided with rewards for being able to save um, and bring in your recyclable um, materials and this system involves the launch of four community collection points in Beaufort, Crocile, Lavery, and Castries. Um, patrons would need to register and obtain a reward card. And the, the patrons will bring in PT bottles and HCP containers and exchange for points and then be able to redeem points for products, services, or cash. Right. So... <laughs> That is it for me. And I know there's one other presentation and then we would invite uh, questions and a discussion. Thank you okay. very much. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Perhaps Mr. Rich, I can look at the video to that jingle and send that to you and maybe a little later on we can share it with the students. Sure. But thank you for that synopsis of the Replast um, project. Um, I know I saw some questions come in from some of the students, and I know they do have quite a number of questions on the, the workings of the project itself. Um, for now, let me hand over to um, the team from the Department of Sustainable Development. So let me ask Ms. Janelle Norville to uh, take over that section of the introductions and the presentation from uh, Department of Sustainable Development. Good morning, everybody. Barbara, you gave me a new name. It's Janelle Volney. <laughs> My sincere apologies. It just struck me a minute ago, but I <laughs> apologize. Yes. <laughs> sorry very much. So I'm, I'm no very sorry, Janelle. Mm -hmm. Okay. The team we have for this um, initiative within the Department of Sustainable Development is made up of myself. I'm a Sustainable Development and Environment Officer. Our legal officer, Ms. Kate Wilson, as well as our science and technology officer, single officer. We all try our best to we all try our best to link our work, and therefore we have a number of other persons, example in our chemicals team that also contributes to this um, area. Right now, I don't believe most of them are online because they had a few clashes, but you have me, I will try my best to assist in all of the areas. The Department of Sustainable Development um, strategy to move forward in dealing with single-use plastic and plastic pollution on the whole is by trying our best to manage the consumption patterns of our citizens. We mainly do this through encouraging persons to pick responsibly when they purchase the items. For example, you purchase something that is biodegradable instead of a plastic material, or rather what you can do, if you do end up with any plastic material, single-use plastic, we encourage persons to recycle or reuse or repurpose. 
one of the main phases that you can go ahead to the next slide. One of the main approaches that we have taken is the phase out of single use plastic by reducing our waste. This is through the banning of styrofoam and plastic food service containers. As of 1st of August, 2019, this act was enacted, it was put in place 1st of August, 2019. This allows us to ban or restrict the importation of all styrofoam food service containers and selected plastic materials, single use specifically. It, we ensure that it's a phased approach to allow our importers, our consumers to use up their stock of plastic material, a single use plastic material that we have selected to ban. And we chose with consultation, with meetings, with stakeholders, the public, we decided to choose the most commonly um, problematic plastic material, which includes the polystyrene, which is styrofoam, and other selected plastic material, as you heard from the other presenters, such as the PT. But in this particular law, it only targets PT food service containers. And you may ask, what is food service containers? Those are containers that are used specifically by the beverage and food industries. So when you go to a restaurant, the um, foldable containers that you would have gotten your food in, those are the material, the items that we targeted. So our main target for this um, reducing our waste, reducing single-use plastic, reducing our dependence on single-use plastic is to attempt to eliminate our dependence on those materials. So now we can share a video with you. This is a PSA that we have been circulating with, to the, with the public to, give, to educate you so that you can make better choices in your single-use plastic or your purchasing patterns. St. Lucia is taking a stance against plastic pollution. Plastic contributes to pollution at every stage of its life cycle, from its production to its disposal. The improper disposal of single-use plastics can worsen the effect of climate change by contributing to flooding, as plastics block drains and end up in waterways during heavy rainfall events. Flooding leads to loss of property and life, diseases, and environmental damage. St. Lucia's journey to reducing single-use plastics commences on August 1st, 2019. Let's beat plastics pollution. Practice proper waste disposal and reduce, reuse, and recycle plastics. For more information, please contact the Department of Sustainability development at 451-8746. So this video pretty much gave you in a nutshell everything that we are trying to do to educate the public and to ensure that you use plastic or irresponsibly reuse, reduce, repurpose plastic. And as was um, brought up before, this will all contribute to our circular economy, reducing waste, and of course with the Replast project, where they bring in the recycling of um, plastic or exporting of plastic bottles in St. Lucia. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, Chanel. Thank you. I particularly enjoyed that video. I would like to ask you to share it with me um, so that I can use it on our replast um, platforms. No so problem. these are our presentations um, by the resource team that you have at your disposal this morning. We are also joined by Ms. Nalia Mahal, who wears a few hats, but she's um, associated with the Replast project. Um, and she's also um, actively involved in the Caribbean Youth Environmental Network. And the CYEN has been doing a lot of work around the, the um, the Caribbean. Um, Snale is also with Replast working with schools. So I guess it's um, an opportunity to start thinking of, you know, how she how she can connect with the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in some of the projects. I, I believe that you had had a project that you had planned to work on last year and COVID interfered with that. So anyway, Snale is on. Let me just ask Snale to put on her, mic, her camera just to say good morning and anything else. And thereafter we'll open for your questions.
Oh, sorry, my mic was off. Good morning, everybody. Hello? Hi, good morning, Hi. Natalia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. I just thought it would be nice for the students to see who it is we're talking about. And feel free, Snally, at any point during the question and answer if you can jump in. Um, if you yourself can maybe ask some thought provoking questions that perhaps the students themselves had not thought of, which would be very vital to their, their knowledge about the issue. So um, I think you would be very useful in that regard. Thank you. So at this point, I will open the floor to the students. When you're asking a question, um, unmute your mic and um, let us see you. You can also um, release your video button so you can, you can ask a question and we can see who we're speaking with. You can also say your name, so that would be cool as well. So I, I hope, yes, please state your name. So um, who's brave and who's just going to lead this charge for us this morning? Because we want to make sure that every minute counts for you today. Hello, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Nala Daria. And firstly, I would just like to thank you guys for the lovely presentations. I am pretty sure that I can speak for everyone when I say that the information obtained will definitely aid us in the completion of our school-based assessment. So to start this off, Mr. Sili, this is my question to you. How has the implementation of the Styrofoam and Single-Use Plastics Act affected the plastic waste stream at the sanitary landfill? Has the Solid Waste Management authorities noticed a significant reduction, or do you still notice a great amount of single-use plastics? Thank you. From the time of the ban, um, there's a notable, noticeable decrease in Styrofoam, of course. Um, however, that is something that would have to be quantified over a period of time. Um, the latest, um, what do I say, waste characterization study undertaken was done by the REPLAS project it, in collaboration with um, the Solid Waste Management Authority. We are still waiting on the results of that to be finalized, um, both publicized. It. Um, and we will be do, undertaking uh, another waste characterization study. Um, in the next couple of months, uh, when, time, when resources allow because of the time that we're in, um, and then we could now say, okay, this is what we will notice over that, at that point in time. I don't think um, a plastic waste characterization study was done. Um, in in our, our last characterization study was done in 2008. I don't think it was specific down to, to highlight, um, to, to pay the particular attention to single-use plastics. However, the one from we we did in conjunction with Replast and the next one we will we will be doing will give us that kind of information. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. All right. Good morning. My name is Twinkle Gustav. And here's my question. There are many ways in which um, plastic waste can be managed, such as recycling. And we all know that this is the most pop popular form. The question is, can all plastic be recycled? And is recycling the most effective way of managing plastic waste? Okay, Mr. Silly, you want to tackle that one? And perhaps Mr. Roach can jump in as well. Okay. Um, Plastic, when you, when you look at the waste hierarchy of um, dealing with waste management, the, first, the what they'll tell you primarily is the reduction. So if you could stay away from use of plastic, as um, Ms. Volney was saying, and their campaign um, is to first reduce it. So you're right, it, it is not the most cost-effective way. The, first co the cost-effective way is to pretty much don't have any to manage. However, this is almost impossible for you to to stay without plastics. The reason that we have such a problem with plastics right now is because it, it takes care of such needs for you. It's durable and flexible and all of those things. So you see that you, you, you will end up having a certain amount of plastics to deal with. Um, plastics in themselves, recycling can be done. Well, before you get to recycling, you could probably see if you could repurpose it. However, again, repurposing could only take up so much. And all of those things, I'm going, all of the little side avenues I'm going on is to actually see if 
the students could pick up on certain things because we don't have all the answers and some of the answers will come from new age persons like you coming up with fresh lenses on life and, and access to information to come up with new ideas. So um, that's some of the reasons I'm, I'm speaking the way I'm speaking to the point. Um, recycling, when it comes to recycling, recycling the Taiwanese, the Japanese, people, people who are well-versed and have that industry going will tell you it's expensive. And uh, that expense in our in our small con small island developing state context is actually makes it a little not um, cost effective. That's why you're not seeing a lot of recycling being done on island. However, some plastics are being processed, either shredded or flaked or baled and bagged and sold across across the the, the uh, sold to other industries. So we don't really do recycling on island. However, trying to stay in the business of recycling um, has the, the economics of it is a little prohibitive. So there are other things that you could probably do with plastics and uh, we're, waiting, we're waiting on you students to come up and help us more in the industry. So that's why the information gathering right now will actually provide Info, well, information gathering will, will have information there ready for you to analyze and now, and now give suggestions. Other than that, now it's just a matter certain private individuals get into the process, into the, the business of collecting plastics, processing, which is just bailing and, like I said, flaking and selling off to industry uh, abroad. Thanks, uh, Ms. Mr. Roach. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yes, um, so just to expand on, on what uh, Mr. Seeley has said in terms of, and specifically if you answer the, the part about uh, what if all types of plastic uh, can be recycled. Uh, most types of plastic can in fact be recycled from a technical point of view. The technology exists to be able to recycle most types of plastic. So something like polystyrene, the styrofoam that is so um, problematic and has now been banned in St. Lucia and other uh, Caribbean islands. Uh, that can actually be recycled. However, because styrofoam is so light, um, the cost of collecting styrofoam to be recycled is uh, entirely prohibitive, as, as Justin would have mentioned, and therefore it's not um, economically viable, and that's why uh, it's an easier option to ban instead of um, of recycle. Uh, the two products that the Replast OECS project um, are involved in, in particular the PET bottles and the HGP bottles, and PET, uh, just to clarify, PET is the bottle that comprises all of your soft drink and your water bottles, and so that clear um, plastic. Uh, those two plastics are quite easy um, to recycle, and there are lots of options in terms of the end use. So PET bottles can be recycled yeah. to form carpet fiber and stuffing for toys and pillows and, uh, and mops and so forth. So there are lots of different markets that you can um, facilitate uh, through recycling of, of those products. And, and that's why they are the two uh, most common um, products that are recycled from the plastic perspective. Thank you. Questions, please. Um, good morning. Thank you again for assisting us with this project. My name is Emma Felix, and my question for you, Mr. Roach, once again, is what kind of products do you plan on recycling the plastics into so that they do not re-enter our environment? And who will be the target market for these products? Right, thanks for that question. So the plastic that is uh, proposed to be collected and um, recycled. Again, it's uh, two types, PET and HDP. PET stands for polyethylene terephthalate and HDP high density polyethylene. Uh, right now, the plan is to collect those plastics and ship them to a uh, market uh, buyer in Honduras. And that um, buyer uses 
the plastics to make things like um, like mops. Uh, they can also make carpet fiber, uh, other types of fibers. So you can actually use PT bottles to make uh, clothing, uh, polyester clothing. The material polyester is identical in chemical composition to that of PT. Um, so there are a number of possibilities for recycling of PT and HDP, um, and it depends on the particular market. So right now we are going to Honduras. Why we're going to Honduras is because there are established markets there. However, uh, the intention is, and the vision is that as the Caribbean develops its recycling capacities and so, and the quantities of material increase, it will reach a point where um, St. Lucia can decide to establish its own uh, plastic recycling facility and make final products um, from the material or any other um, one of the islands because there will be substantial uh, recycling happening and the quantities will allow for a feasible um, recycling industry. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, good morning. Good morning. My name is Brittany. Um, and we understand that the Replast project aims to reduce plastic waste uh, in the environment and to recycle them into new products. So our question is, what is done with the chunks of plastic left over? Did you say what is what is done with the plastics what left? What is done with the plastics left over? For example, if we use part of a bin to make um, a, a board. What is done with the plastics left over? Hmm. Right, so you're asking what is done with the plastics that are not recycled, is that the question? So um, if it is, then uh, anything that is not recycled, uh, it's the responsibility of the St. Lucia Solid Waste Authority. And right now um, it gets, uh, it's disposed of at the landfill. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, the need for recycling is, 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 so, is, so, very, um, is so very critical because uh, you want to avoid having to dispose of any landfill. St. Lucia, of course, is an island country and there is going to be a time when you run out of landfill space. There's going to be a time when there's no more space available for disposal. So, um, currently, that's what happens. Uh, and of course, this is a pilot project. The intention is to develop the recycling capabilities, to develop the recycling culture. And once that is done, then there are other opportunities for recycling other types of, of materials. So PVC is another type of material, low density polyethylene, uh, such as your plastic shopping bags. And so uh, those also have the potential to be recycled. Um, but the OECS project is starting with just the PT and the HDP as a pilot. And uh, as I said, it's hoped that um, as time goes along and as the culture develops, um, the country can get involved in other types of recycling. Does that answer your question or perhaps we yes, didn't Yes, thank, thank you so question. much. Okay, all right. Another question? Good day. My Hi. name is Melanie James, and I know some of the stuff we touched on. However, I would like to know how many types of plastics are most in circulation in the Caribbean region, which ones are and will be most collected under this project, and how will this affect the end products produced under this project? Mr. Roach? Right, so I think I heard most of the question. If I if I um didn't answer part, you can you can probably repeat it. So the types you asked the types of plastic that um that currently exist. Uh, so plastic is categorized into seven different types for um, and this is simply for the purposes of of recycling. Uh, polyethylene terephthalate, which is PT, and high density polyethylene are the first two and and 
um, and they comprise the majority of, of the plastics in a typical waste stream, including that of St. Lucia. Uh, and that, those are the two uh, items that are part of the project. Other than that, there's PVC, polyvinyl chloride, um, which is uh, what is used to manufacture you know, PVC pipes and so. Then there's low density polyethylene, uh, which is what comprises your plastic shopping bags. There's polypropylene, which is a thicker, more rigid type of plastic used to make more durable plastic items. And then there's polystyrene, uh, known as commonly known as styrofoam, which has been quite problematic um, because of how light and how easily it is to blow in the wind and so forth. Um, and that has now been banned in San Lucia. And the so those are the first six. And then the seventh category is just a category for others. So any other types of plastic that are out there, um, polycarbonates and uh, different, uh, the, uh, a host of, of different types of plastics, all that is combined into other. Um, and usually they are not much recycling opportunities because the quantities are sometimes very low and it does not make for economic recycling. So those are the seven types of plastic. Um, the Replast project is only about the first two at this point in time, polyethylene terephthalate and high density polyethylene. Um, and in terms of the, um, the, the uses of it, uh, so it goes to a plant in Honduras where it's used to make uh, things like mops and so. Um, I'm not too sure what part I missed out. I feel that I missed out a part. So just clarify for me what, what was the other part of the question? I wanted to know how the, per, the type of plastic used in the recycling process could affect the end results. Right. So uh, different types of plastic have different properties some of which are not compatible. So, um, so in our process, we have to ensure that we separate our PET plastic from uh, the HDP plastic. We have also to make sure that PVC um, plastic just does not get in, in the mix at all because PVC can contaminate, um, one piece of PVC can con con contaminate an entire batch of um of either PET or HDP. So it's important that the types of plastic that we are accepting, the PET and the HDP, that it be not contaminated with um, things like PVC. Uh, and, um, and that's part of the process. So that's why in our, um, our system, we have people that are trained to detect and to identify different uh, types of material and uh, to be able to separate out those types of material. However, there are, just as there are some types that are not compatible, there are some materials that can be compatible. So you can mix PVC, sorry, PET with HDP, um, again, from a technical point of view, and you can make things like plastic lumber. So the whole plastic recycling industry is in fact a science and that science will then determine what the end product um, is. So uh, the people that are involved have to be aware of what are the contaminants and what um, can be mixed together. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Any questions, any other questions? Good morning. My name is Chris Ann Florius and my question is for Ms. Janelle Volney. We know that the REPLAST project is one way of reducing pollution in St. Lucia, but do you all have any other sustainable activities that you all want to introduce to reduce pollution in the country? Excellent question. I, I wanted to ask a question like that myself. Um, Janelle? Hi, thank you for the question. At this time, uh, the main activity that we're looking at, other than eliminating the or reducing the plastic for importation, 
Um, some of it has already been brought up, such as cleanup campaigns. We have had participated in um, underwater cleanup. We have also with CYEN and other um, agencies. And also, of course, we've encouraged persons to reduce, reuse, recycle their plastic material. But those are the main areas right now that we have focusing on. Thank you very much, Ms. Walney. Um, one question I wanted to ask, not to steal from the students' time, is, I mean, we know we talk about the circular economy and we know where we need to go um, as a country and as a world. Um, is it realistic to expect that in addition to, you know, the bans like on single-use plastics and so that government agencies like Solid Waste Management Authority, Sustainable De Department can can create interventions targeted at, say, the business community, specific interventions to engage the business community in sort of shifting their whole operations to make it more environment friendly, um, create incentives for, you know, um, manufacturers and, and what have you, um, in terms of the types of processes they use so that they themselves can contribute to reducing the amount of plastics and other um, toxic material that ends up in the environment. So I imagine that question is for both Mr. Justin and Ms. Volney. So perhaps Mr. Roots can get a cup of water. <laughs> well, first, the, my department, which includes solid waste as well, the next thing we also encourage them, we do provide incentives to importers of um, biodegradable compostable material. So at this time, if a importer decides to bring in a food service container, they will get 0% import duties on that. So we're looking into concessions for them to encourage them to switch their items into more environmentally friendly. Thank you. Um, Dr. Yes, yes, Dr. Felix. No, that's Nalia. Nalia, okay, go ahead. Um, I just want to say that in terms of plastic pollution and reduction of plastic use, especially single-use plastic, I think it is important that um, the element of individual action is highlighted and encouraged. Um, Yes, the governmental solution department of sustainable development, projects like Replast and the Solid Waste Management Authority. Um, they, I mean, things need to be done or they are doing things um, in, on the policy level and um, there are activities being implemented on the ground. However, as young persons, as young people, as the future leaders of St. Lucia, this, I mean, it sounds cliche, but I mean, it is the truth. Uh, you have to be able to take personal responsibility. Um, it's like each one, move one, each one, encourage one, each one um, becomes the example that you want for yourself and for your country. So in your own life, you need to be able to take those um, make those important decisions where you choose that you're not going to be using single-use plastic and more you're going to carry your, your glass water bottle or your stainless steel reusable bottle that you're going to refuse um, single-use cutlery when you go out that you're going to try to implement some kind of composting at home and encourage your family members and it becomes when you live by that example, you encourage the persons around you to also do that. And it may be something small, you may consider it small, but if you do it consistently, people recognize you for being that doer, the person who takes action, and they model themselves, even if it's something small, they end up modeling themselves after you. And it's basically like a snowball effect. It may take some time, but is helpful. So that's just something I wanted to say. Thank you very much. That's an excellent point, Snalia. 
Um, and to sum it up, um, perhaps maybe what we need to consider is if every single individual in a community or in a society takes that sense of ownership and takes, makes a personal commitment to reducing um, or reusing um, their, their plastics or recycling their plastics, imagine the cumulative impact it can have. So I imagine what Snalia is saying, even outside of government creating an enabling environment, like for instance, making incentives available to people um, or banning things. If we, every single citizen has the consciousness that we will divert our plastics from the environment, um, think of the, 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 the impact that can have on the, where we, where we want to go, that circular economy concept that Mr. Seeley spoke to us about. So I think that sum it, sums it up very nicely. Another question? Yes, good day. Um, my name is Sidan Mitchell. And my question is, Whilst targeting plastic waste, which is currently polluting the earth, and a big step in remedying the issue of solid pollution, does sustainable development have any plans to extend further into the root cause of pollution and aim at using safer, more biodegradable alternative materials to plastic? If so, what are your tactics for introducing this material and ensuring its use over plastics? Yes, yes. So our, um, our strategy to move towards more environmentally friendly material, first of all, was to, we had to, first of all, find out from the stakeholders um, what materials they are, what the main materials they were using, and to see there were alternatives to that. And this is why we decided to choose the food service, start with the food service containers, because they were um, common or readily available alternatives to that. So therefore, when we went, we went into the banning of the plastic that were causing more problems for us on island, and then we moved further into advising persons on the more environmentally friendly materials such as the bagas or the paper material to encourage them to transition. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Excellent. Next question. Good morning. My name is Brioni Mathre. And my question is, are the plastics transported to Martinique after a certain amount has been collected? And if so, wouldn't this method affect productivity? Mr. Roach? Right, so the plastics uh, currently are sent to Honduras. Uh, that is the market we have identified as the most feasible um, option from uh, an economic point of view. Uh, there was a plant in Martinique that would process plastic. However, that, that plant is, has now been closed um, because it could not uh, sustain itself. Um, and one of the reasons it could not sustain itself is because there simply wasn't enough uh, plastic material available. So that that is, you know, being re-looked at. Um, and Again, it's hoped that once we can build the volumes within this region, that we can have uh, more sustainable um, approaches to recycling. So at present, uh, there's no shipments to Martinique. Uh, those shipments are being made to Honduras. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Thank you. I have a very quick question for Mr. Seeley. Um, Mr. Seeley, you spoke, I was very fascinated when you sort of introduced the IT, IT and waste and all of that. And it strikes me that perhaps when we think of waste management, we only think of handling of the waste. We only think of collecting all the waste everywhere and driving it to the landfill and all the mucky, 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 dirty work. But it strikes me that there are a lot of careers that can be supported by this, 
by in waste management that have nothing to do with actually putting your hand in, in, in the waste. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that IT, innovation, technology. What are the implications in terms of careers? And how does that bridge to other, you know, development agendas that are going on now? Now we're hearing the member states talking about the blue economy and all of that. And we know all these things are information-driven, technology-driven, innovation-driven. Um, just... Solid waste management is like a spider web. There's a number of different interconnecting parts, and there's a, a lot to keep track of at any one point in time. So, case in point, when we deal with um, unplanned development, we had a modality of distributing collection, collection communal bins, and uh, we had what you call collection points. However, that, that in itself becomes a nuisance because of abuse what you tend to get with our small terrain and steep slopes, walk, this waste, which is vulnerable to attack by dogs and cats and chickens, it gets into the drain, the drains and speedily washes down into the, into the marine environment. Then you get marine litter, increasing marine litter, then it now hampers the blue economy. So proper waste management, um, the, Waste management done properly can actually help these, these knock-ons. So you, you, you now have a better environment for the better marine environment, improve the, the blue economy, which now goes on to support the tourism product. Um, when, when we're now looking at collection, um, you're now looking at, eh, to a point even to, to change the whole stigma about waste management, we want to actually change the thing changing the, the nomenclature from collection to logistics because how, what, you, when you, what you look at waste management, we are actually a logistics company. Mm -hmm. We go for the, the very, every day we go to the extents of the country, whether outward to the coast or inward, and uh, we collect waste. And in that waste in itself has a resource. Yes, it's not in the most attractive of forms, but it is actually a resource. If you could liken it to, to mining, actually in Japan, they look at, removing the trace metals from the electronic waste and they can they call it they actually call it um urban mining and whatever um dry waste quote unquote dry waste which is waste with a high calorific factor from your physics days you'll remember calorie is the measure of energy um that's waste with high energy that can actually support um, heat exchange where they burn it for heat in places like Japan. Um, so, and then now when you look at persons in Taiwan, when you look at persons who actually do deal with e-waste, they look at themselves as commodity traders. Because when you now go through the process of extracting all those trace metals from the main part of an electronic item, what you call the print circuit board, you get copper and and as you know, copper was on the rise. The price of copper was on the rise, um, has been on the rise. So there are times where people were actually go in and actually, sorry about that, steal copper. And these are, these are all the knock-on effects around solid waste management. So if you, like I said, if you just limit your, your idea of waste management to two guys on the back of a truck, you're actually selling yourself quite short. When, if you get involved in waste management and the different um, trajectories it could take you and the, and I don't know of a discipline that cannot be used to, to improve soil waste management. Um, as we, from, the, from just my little conversation, we've spoken about hydrology, geology, the bio, um, marine, uh, marine um, engineering, um, economics, um, cultural, because even now, it, it, even to try to implement a project like the Replast project, they have to get an understanding of what people would have accept or not accept. So you now have to have a certain amount of sociology and learn about cultural issues, what is acceptable, even through things like um, um, segregation bins, what is the best colors that might work in Samusha. And all of those things require some level of thinking. So every facet, every piece of waste management for it to be done properly involves a lot of disciplines and a lot of thinking. So the possibilities are almost Unless I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Seeley. Um, I noticed it's 11.23 and this conversation is so 
interesting for me. So let me see students, let's see how much more time we can get, how much more, um, you know, how many more questions you can field before we have to wrap up. So let's take another question. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Eva Alexander and my question is directed to Mr. Roach and Mr. Seely. Um, what is the real cost of recycling with respect to fossil fuels consumption? Are we not just simply trading one problem, the plastics, for another like fossil fuel combustion and global warming? Hmm. Big question. <laughs> Justin, you want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, your, your yes, mind is all right. Okay. Yes, I could take a stab out of it, but um, I honestly don't know the true cost of waste money of of the recycling product. And um, I I would say to some extent, yeah, there's a trade off. Uh, however, um, plastics end up in the environment and the long the, the the troublesome point about comparing what you want to do vis a vis what you possibly mitigating um, because plastics to come deteriorate, end up in the marine environment, up the, up the food chain, back into you and affect you, is very hard to, to calculate. So you may see um, the cost of energy for the, the cost of putting it out for disposal, but is that the true cost of improper waste disposal vis-a-vis -vis, um, recycling? Um, so in, in effect, yes, to collect the plastics, to sort it, um, process it and send out for, for recycling. So you're not even looking at the cost of just turning from one material to the next. You have to go upstream and take on all those costs. Um, is there a direct comparison? I don't think so. Um, is it difficult to do? I would definitely think so because how do you now put a figure on the possible damage to your to you as an individual from eating, um, eating, consuming a, a fair amount of plastics over a period of time. So uh, that's, a, that's it's a difficult question to, to give you a straight answer to. And uh, that's how I could bring it. And I beg of Mr. Roach to, to see if you could put a conclusion to it. Yeah, so um, very, very good question for which there's, there's no easy answer. Um, the thing about it is one, one of the things we have to take into consideration is what is called the, um, the triple um, P approach, uh, dealing with planet, profit, and the people. Um, and we have to look at, at all, all those things. So it's easy to say, okay, let's not use plastic, um, but what effects that will have on society, on um, the economies of, of the societies, which... Uh, depend on the manufacture of plastics and so. Um, but it, it, um, it leads to the point that more research is needed uh, in these areas. And these are good opportunities for students such as yourselves to get involved in um, doing cost benefit analyses and doing what is called natural resource accounting. So when you take off, take um, oil from the ground, what Besides the value of the oil, what are the other costs that are involved? Um, as Justin pointed out, um, the cost of the damage to the environment, the cost of um, uh, suffering to human health. And so, uh, and those, there, there's room, there's a lot of room to do more studies to be able to quantify these things. Um, however, notwithstanding all of that, um, it is generally shown that recycling does have um, both environmental benefits as well as uh, economic benefits. Um, but as Mr. Seeley would have pointed out very early in, in his discourse, uh, the hierarchy of waste management is still very much um, prevalent and, and still should be applied. So reducing, reusing and recycling in that order. The first order of the day is to be able to reduce um, your consumption. And that's the very difficult in a consumeristic society that we're all part of now. We are all um, bombarded with advertisements to buy the new phones and to buy bottled water 
um, and to eat fast foods, which has its own um, challenges with respect to single-use plastics. And so um, it's a question of how do we balance that with the realities of environmental preservation um, on the one hand, which is the planet part of it, um, but also the need for people to survive and the need for organizations to make a profit. Um, and because there's no easy answer for that is because of the reasons why we have these challenges and we have to have these discussions and so. So um, I throw that back out at you, the youth, to get involved more and to, um, you know, come up with your own research and, and, um, and conclusions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, very good. I, I see um, we really have two minutes left. You wanted to add something, Mr. Seeley? Yes, and to, to add, to, to double up on what Mr. Root was saying, um, I think it's our job right now to understand the limits where we are. And we have recognized that. And in order to try to encourage or move the needle, um, that is where I think it was very important that I mentioned that information, tech, information and data collection that we're doing now. So this is always available to anybody because we don't have the, the we don't have all the ideas. So these things, um, you can move it. Uh, and that's another angle economics as to understanding how do you properly quantify that, which will now help actually help you with your marketing, your communication as to what is to stress on people, what is the need, why there is a need for certain practices as compared to what is being done now and what is the true cost of, of, of you either doing or, la or lack of doing. So anytime, anytime you're ready, we, we could further the conversation to spark some some cells and and see if we could actually move the move the bar, bar, the middle on that as well okay thank you um i see it's now eleven thirty, dr felix time is um moving on us i don't know what your constraints are mr roach is available for another few minutes um mr seeley i think um, can give us a little more time. I know the students had all their questions. So um, it's your call, Dr. Felix, on what you want us to do. Should we continue for another three or four questions? Um, yes, I think, because I've been communicating with my students. Me. Um, I think that there are about two more, I think there are two more questions. Um, so students, could you, uh, could we just give them the time to ask these um, and I think I think then we'll be okay. Okay, excellent. Okay, so we'll take the last two questions. Hi, good morning. My name is Beyonce Innocent, and my question is for Mr. Justin Seely. My question is: earlier in your presentation, you elaborated that there were only two waste management facilities on island. It was stated that the one in Beaufort was inactive and that the Degla plant had a lifespan of 20 years. The plant has been in operation from 2003 and has roughly two years remaining on island. Why hasn't another plant been in development, being that the main plant would roughly give out in two years' time? Thank you for that. Um, one, the, that's in my presentation, you know, that I put design life um, in, in constructing the Diglo landfill, it was given a design life of 20 years. However, that is with a projection on the volume of the quantum of waste and the volume it will occupy. Present, right now, we're undertaking a topographical survey to provide a three dimensional um, model of the landfill. And we are with the levels that we take, we will actually now be able to determine the true final height that uh, the true final quantity of waste that could fit, be fit into that three dimensional space. Um, so from under, from completing that, we will under, we have our under, uh, we will have an, under, an understanding of the density of the waste that is being placed there and um, with proper compaction and all that, how much true space we have in there. So that's, that's so I have to qualify that and say that's the design life. It's a theoretical. Practically, we, we in, the, in the process right now of, of understanding practically what can be placed in there and basically and how long we actually have to, and a projection on how long the landfill can, 
can actually um, take waste. The search for another landfill, we have actually, we started that process some five or more years ago, and it's almost impossible to find a location in St. Lucia where that, that um, where you could actually suit, fit a landfill um, because you need buffers around it and away from fresh water, uh, marine waters because of the leachate that could possibly sink in the earth and cause environmental destruction and uh, other, other criteria. And uh, it's been proven a little impossible. Um, two years ago, a little, more, a little more than that, the government took a policy directive which is captured in Cabinet Conclusion 679 of 2019, which took a policy directive to go um, landfill free, free by 2030 to align with the review of the Sustainable Development Goals. And um, they actually invested in technology, which is at the end of my presentation that I highlighted, which are small scale pyrolysis units. So, um, but trying to do the whole transition is a mammoth of an, of an undertaking. So we, we started off by closing the, the landfilling process in Viewford and introducing said technology with the balance. And while we roll out this, the implementation of this technology, we are transporting any balance of the waste to the igloo for now. So this is not something that's going to be long term. Um, the idea is to use those small units in what we consider a decentralized mode model where the, an appropriate amount of units will be placed in a facility closer to the generators. So um, imagine one of those things uh, closer to Sufre and one closer to Canaries, let's see. Yeah, the reason for that is because of where the Vifor landfill was located, waste collected from as far as um, Buto. Um, and on the West Coast and um, Poale on the East Coast was trucked down to Viewfort. And therefore you had waste being transported for a fair, fair distance. So the idea is to actually use those small units and spread it out around the, uh, the south of the island where waste, will, waste collected now can actually go to go a shorter distance for processing. And the uh, units would have treated, like I stated, would treat the waste using the um, high heat, reducing it to about 4% of its, of its size or mass. And that, that ash would have to be managed as well. So um, I hope that covers most of your, your question. If I didn't, um, please feel free to state. Thank you. Okay, and I think we have a final question. Yes, good morning. My name is Steven Henry, and my question is for Mr. Roach. Um, during your presentation, I heard you speak of the Replast Rewards card. And my question is, um, what impact has such an incentive had on the overall number of people who have joined as a Replast Rewards member? And also, has it also had an impact on the amount of plastic that the initiative has been receiving over the years? Right, thanks for that question. Um, and I will probably ask Barbara to um, intervene at, at some point. Uh, but, um, but just generally, so it has been proven that, you know, a reward system is what, um, is what attracts people to uh, the, the concept of, of recycling. Um, you either have a system based on rewards um, and that is a voluntary system or you have a system based on on legislation and enforcement and so um, and a reward system has you know in, in various places proven quite effective and that's the system that has been adopted here um, it is quite early in the program uh, we have seen uh, that people have um, been uh, <clears throat> attracted to, to to the system so far but um, but the reality is you know we are in, in early times as yet. And the other reality is COVID has in fact, you know, postponed some of our plans and some of the rollout of the, um, of the project. So we are not where we need to be at this point in time, um, understandably so because of the impacts of COVID. Um, so 
Yeah, that's uh, my contribution. And uh, I know Barbara is in quite involved in, in the rewards program itself. So if um, Barbara, you want to add anything to, um, to what I would have said? Yes, yes. I, I think what I can speak to is the potential of the rewards of the incentivized collection system to have a noticeable, uh, considerable impact on the amount of plastic that ends up in the environment. And let me explain why. Um, for you to be able to achieve the aims of um, the REPLAS project or any such initiative, um, I think from our various speakers this morning, we understand that it, it requires a multi-sectoral approach. It requires different entities from different aspects of the society coming together and making a contribution. So we heard from Janelle that government is responsible for creating the policy environment. We heard from Mr. Seeley that, you know, the authority does the, is the boots on the ground. A lot of the elbow grease is handling the whole logistics of managing the waste. Um, and then we sing from projects like Replast, which um, um, is supposed to be driven by both the public and the private sector. So the, the public government agencies facilitate um, certain things, but the private aid, um, sector comes involved and does things. What can the private sector do? The private sector can come up and say, for instance, a Massey Stores or WLBL can say, I'm going to make 500 points available a month to the um, average Jane and Joe in St. Lucia, the consumer, to reward them for bringing back their plastics. So me as a business, I perhaps don't have the wherewithal or the knowledge or my business is not set up for me to do aggressive, aggressive recycling, but I can contribute to the process. So that's the incentivized collection system gives the private sector um, an avenue to start participating in the process of creating the circular economy that Mr. CD has been telling us about. So the consumer now then bring their plastics and they get their rewards. What I can say um, is Whilst the project was supposed to have been much further along than it is now, and that is understandably, understandably so, because you yourself, from your own experience, you can see the impact that COVID has had on your own schooling and your own ability to be able to do the things you did normally. So the project itself has had to sort of reorganize itself, re-strategize, wait for them to reopen the country. We cannot go and we cannot um, operate collection points where people are coming in bringing plastics until the, the health authorities say that. But the first replast collection point that was rolled out, 60 people that I'm saying to you, under 100 people came to bring the plastic they had been collecting. And they, between them, were able to generate 975 pounds of PET. 60 people in the Grusili area. So, um, and these 60 people registered for the rewards card. So we can do the math and see when replas collection points are rolled out, you know, Grusili will have two more points, um, two more collection points. Um, Labry will have a collection point. There will be one in Viewfort. And these are the ones that, are, that, that the project is using to pilot the, the, the initiative. After these collection points get off the ground, the aim is to work together as all these group of stakeholders to roll out the project in other parts of St. Lucia. So imagine the impact, you know, the volume of plastic you can generate and the, um, and the impact that you can have to be able to achieve the objectives of the project. So like I said, we, we so far have, I think, with under 400, perhaps 400, people who have applied for a replast collection card, but we have a population of 170,000 plus, you know? So as time goes by, as more companies come on board and say, I want to participate in the, in the project, I want to give points, these same companies now being oriented to the project, they can now start to roll out initiatives in their own company. They can say to replast, okay, we want to do our own in-house registration. So on a particular day, maybe for World Environment Day, they can say, we're going to undertake to register all our staff to your platform. You know, so as Mr. Seeley said and Mr. Roth said, you, this elephant, you can only bite it off one bite at a time. And it's, you know, it's a multiply effect. 
So as we bring on more businesses, we will get more rewards to make available, you know, to attract more people with the businesses as well as what types of services they offer. So you have pharmacies, you have restaurants, but maybe we need to get people who are selling petrol to come on board to say, I want to give petrol because if I give petrol, then more men will join. You know, if, um, if, if we get people in building construction that will say, I will give some points, then we have a different type of people, maybe contractors and their families will have something that appeals to them that can pull them into, into the network. So like I said, you know, a bite at a time. That's what we're doing. But I imagine from the stats that I gave you for the first replast collection point, um, you can see what we can project what the impact of the rewards program can have. And I hope that answers your question. Could I, could I also add to that as well? Um, so waste management and the government by extension has rec recognized that we cannot, the government cannot support the totality of waste management. And that is where part of the, the circular economy is getting um, what you may call extended producer responsibility um, where the, the generators, the primary generators of waste should actually maybe take on part of the responsibility for waste management. What that can effectively do and what we've been trying to support as well is private sector entering into the market and looking at the waste collected by the, the um, replast. And so maybe instead of sending to Honduras, a small industry could be initiated in St. Lucia for the use of plastic because now you see that as a resource and you come out of school, like I, that's why I keep on stating that you have ideas that we don't have as yet. And you should not sell yourself short that, hey, how can I take those, those things and make an industry of it myself? And right now, um, under the, the, the cabinet memo that I mentioned, 679 or 2019, we did also get approval from the, the present administration for incentives for persons involved in industries which divert waste. So it was not only about vehicles, but it's also about equipment that could be used. So if you, so to give you an example, if you end up establishing an industry that is using waste and preventive and diverted away from the landfill, you can actually get incentives for the, the, some, of, some of what you might need to, 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 to process this waste. So there is an, a sector which is in, in the budding stage right now between the collection of that resource, which we call waste for now, and um, salt waste management. At the end of the day, I come in at the end of the stream to manage what, or I would like to hopefully manage what has totally outlived the purpose where persons now inject themselves into the, the chain and actually can divert some of this, process it, and, 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 die, and put it into a, a different avenue. So this, this is where... Um, and this is where I believe you should be looking at yourself as ent entrepreneurs who could actually do your research now and your research projects on how to, how to make better use of coconuts, how to make better use of the coconut shells, um, what can be done with it. Um, we have figures on um, actually establishing and, and managing a compost heap. We will make that available. So um that that is what i would hope the students get out of this how do we come into this system and uh, look at the ends the the when the ends that are there right now and how what gaps they could actually bridge now or in the near future excellent excellent point for cecily thank you so very much for that and we literally are out of time this has been so engaging Perhaps as we wrap up, I will just ask, because I see a question has come up there, should the um, polluter principle be applied more rigorously in St. Lucia by applying higher taxes? I see Mr. Roach has answered, yes, the polluter principle should be applied more rigorously, but also the extended producer responsibility. So I don't know if that is something that the two of you can speak to very quickly as our point that we will wrap up. Well, seeing, seeing that I, I brought it up, um, yes, I'll... Uh, go at it. So, uh, polluter pays principle is is fine and should be applied. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, but there is also the concept of extended producer responsibility, and that concept has worked well in countries. Um, started off in Germany, uh, in Canada, um, in other parts of Europe, and so 
um, where the, ex the producer themselves take the responsibility um, for a product, what is called from cradle to grave, or now with circular economy from cradle to, cra to cradle to cradle. So they have the responsibility even to take back their um, packaging uh, for reuse and recycling and so forth. Um, and that has to be embedded in law. Of course, there are certain challenges with small island states such as St. Lucia um, adopting that, that principle. Um, but it's not that it, ca it cannot be done. We just need to, you know, brainstorm and see how best we can um, have it have it work in, in our islands. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, um, yes. Okay. I see that answered your question. This has been, it has exceeded my expectations. <laughs> Um, to be able to manage a platform with so many contributors. The students, you have been um, exceptional. I want to thank Mr. Seeley for giving me his entire morning. Um, thank Mr. Roach for wearing three hats here this morning. Um, thank um, Ms. Volney for your time this morning and for always supporting our public relations and our public education initiatives. I want to just thank Dr. Felix for um, sticking with me. We had planned some other thing, other thing before for, and it had to be put off. And so for going the mile for us to have this very, very uh, rich um, exchange this morning. Um, so to close, I will just hand back to Dr. Felix so that she can appropriately close this, this um, session. Thank you so very much, Barbara, uh, Mr. Seeley, doc, um, Dr. Roach, um, Janelle, I am, as I said, why is we been going? I have been, of course, on WhatsApp with my students and they're like, Miss, this was so good. They've truly enjoyed it. It was so useful. So on behalf of the South Lewis Community College Environmental Science students, I really, really, really want to thank you so very much. You all have provided a wealth of information, but going beyond what the students can use for their research project, the kind of advice and recommendations. And I'm hoping the students have, and maybe I should myself just show my video very quickly. I don't know what's behind me and my hair. <laughs> but I just want to thank you so much because you provided also the advice which we need, where the students know when they leave the college's walls, what they can do. And we have a lot of students, I, I have to tell you, I have students, they've got a lot of ideas. Sometimes they're afraid to show it. And I'm hoping that this, um, this panel discussion today has shown them that what they're thinking, Miss, can't we do our own projects? Miss, can we think of another way to, ch to change the status quo? Do you know that do, do we have to be doing this? I think the advice that has come from this panel has really been very encouraging. And I'm hoping that the students realize that there are so many things that we can still do. I love the concept of the rewards card. I love it. And I'm thinking beyond, you know, we've just come out of the SJC virtual um, spots and I'm thinking, but Sir Arthur has houses. Why can't we have a competition to see which house can get the most points when REPLAS is, is fully on board. So, you know, so that the students themselves will be encouraging each other, bring in your plastics because we need to have points for our, our classes. There's so much that can happen. And um, I think that uh, Barbara may be troubling you again for other panel discussions, you know, so I'm giving you a heads up. But thank you very much. And I think on behalf of all the students, we want to say thank you for the time that all of you have taken and for the tremendous amount of information provided to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Felix. And please trouble us. We, we all of our organizations need the public education out there. We need the citizens to be working with us and supporting us. So please trouble us. Thank you very much. And gentlemen and lady, um, Janelle, I'm not seeing you, but have a wonderful day. And we look forward to other future opportunities. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Be there Thank you. Bye-bye.